So, uh, one of your classmates, Sriram, he sent me an email yesterday pointing out something very important that I use the concept of a sequence in the proof of the CSB theorem. Correct? A stopper sequences, double A infinite sequences and B stopper sequences. But we have not really defined the concept and this course is all about asking questions. So, he asked the right question that we have not defined integers yet. So, how can we use the concept of a double infinite sequence? So, therefore, here is a resolution we can define the equivalence relation that we needed using this method. Yeah, it is written on the board, this is an equivalence relation, you can verify that. So, two elements are related if there exists a finite chain of f's and g's between them in some direction. Yeah, this is not really hard to write down. Yeah, it looks complicated on the screen, but it is not complicated at all. And then A stopper sequence is one which contains an element which does not lie in the image of G. B stopper sequence is one equivalence class which does not lie in the image of F and an element in that equivalence class which does not lie in something particular. So, that is how this uh, proof can proceed. And I also forgot to mention that the proof that we covered in the class is due to Julius Koenig. Yeah? So, somebody from your class also asked me if this proof ever uses the axiom of choice, yeah, which is a very controversial as well as the most interesting topic of the set theory part. Yeah, ZFC, as you might know, Zermelo Frankel choice set theory. So, this choice is an important topic which we will cover later in the course, but this proof does not use any axiom of choice, any form of axiom of choice. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, let us proceed then. So, uh, all of you remember that we started with some of the axioms and then I mentioned that there was an axiom of foundation. <coughs> I am just going to talk about a bit of philosophy before we do something proper. So, axiom of foundation, I am not going to write down the axiom, it is not really intuitive in the form it is presented, but it implies something important. Yeah, it implies that there is no, I mean instead of there is no, we can perhaps say that uh, each sequence of this relation is downwards finite okay what do i mean by that so i start with a set i start with a set a0 then a0 contains a1 a1 contains a2 and dot 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 this dot 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 cannot happen right this so on process cannot happen it has to end at some an and that's a full stop a n itself cannot contain another element. For some n, a n cannot contain an element, which means a n has to be the empty set. Right? So, this actually uh, gets rid of this normality. Yeah, in particular, a 0 does not belong to a 0 because if it did, then A0 belongs to A0, belongs to A0, belongs to A0 and then you can pull it down. It is infinite regression kind of situation. Yeah, you remember Munchausen's trilemma? Yeah, this is infinite regression, so we do not want that to happen. And also, uh, yeah, we do not have any such sequences. Yeah, so suppose I am writing some element. Uh, so, this element contains something else and then this dot 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 and you continue. Yeah, you never actually specify the element which is there. 
yeah, this contains this, this contains this, this contains this, and we are just going down. Well, this is also useless. So in our set theory, we assume that we don't have any such situation. And this is axiom of foundation. It says that set theory is well founded. Yeah, it's founded on a base of the empty set, which can be questioned, of course, that empty set is nothing. So everything is founded on nothing. But at least formally speaking, this is what we need. And I am uh, talking about this because today we want to dis discuss construction of some number systems. The first number system that comes to our mind is natural numbers. Yeah, natural numbers, then we have to de define addition of natural numbers. Well, you might say we are being childish. Yeah, you already learnt addition in, in the primary school, but we have to redo it in a formal way. Addition, multiplication, exponentiation of natural numbers, yeah, all these things are important. And we are going to define them properly. Right? So, uh, before we do that, we should first ask the question, what is addition? You take two elements from omega and you give one new element of omega. So, basically, we need a function which has two arguments which are natural numbers. So, first of all, what is omega? And how can we define a function whose domain is omega or something infinite? So, these are the two questions. So, what is omega? Yes? Uh, is sequence of belonging relations, belonging relation, yeah, decreasing sequence, any decreasing sequence of belonging relation. So, what is omega? We already said that omega is n such that n is natural number, but we did not really define it properly, what is a natural number and whether we can do this. So, there is some axiom which, which is called the axiom of infinity So, axiom of infinity, it guarantees existence of an infinite set. Without this, we cannot really define omega as a set. <coughs> guarantees the existence of an infinite set. See, uh, so, so far what we have seen philosophically, uh, that because of Russell's paradox, the collection of all sets is not a set. You remember that? Yes, so th that is not a set. So, uh, similarly, if we do not assume axiom of infinity, then the collection of all natural numbers or collection of all finite sets itself will become a proper class. Yeah, take a moment to understand that. If we do not guarantee the existence of an infinite set, then the collection of all finite sets itself, yeah, you cannot really control it. Yeah, it is beyond control. So, it is a proper class itself. So, therefore, we need axiom of infinity which guarantees the existence of an infinite set so that we can deal with infinity and we have pushed the problem further away from us. Yeah, the problem does not vanish that the certain collection is not a set, that problem does not vanish, but we have just pushed the problem away from us. Understood the idea? Yeah, that after all levels of infinity, which we will define in the course later, after that there is something which is blocking our path, the collection of all sets, which is not a set. But if we just know the remaining axioms of zermelo frankel set theory, the, without the axiom of infinity, then the natural numbers, this omega itself will become a proper class. So, let us write down what is this axiom of infinity. Yeah, this itself is uh, an interesting thing. So, again, this is an existential axiom. It starts with there exists a z. This z is supposed to represent an infinite set such that 
empty set is in Z. Yeah, empty set is guaranteed by the axiom of empty set. Empty set is in Z and for all x in Z, x plus is also in Z. Okay, what is x plus? I should simply write it down. You all know this. x plus is x union singleton x. We use it to define natural numbers, if you remember. Yeah, 1 was 0 plus, 2 was 1 plus. So, n plus 1 is n plus. Yeah, it is the shift operator on natural numbers. So, let us see what this statement means. So, there exists a set which contains empty set and whenever something is an element, then its plus is also an element. So, empty plus is an element, then empty plus plus is an element and so on and so forth. Right? It is guaranteeing something will continue. Are you understanding this? However, this is not just uh, this just guarantees the existence of some such z. Yeah, this is not yet necessarily the collection of natural numbers. Can you see that? Maybe not yet, but when we will do ordinals, you will be able to see that. Yeah, I mean, for example, uh, uh, 0. 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, this is definitely collection of natural numbers, then omega, then omega plus 1, then omega plus 2, and dot, dot, dot. This is an infinite set. You understand omega plus 1? Yeah, omega plus 1 is omega plus then omega plus 2 is omega plus plus and so on. So, this is an infinite set. So, this does not guarantee that omega exists. It just guarantees that some infinite set exists. Then there is another axiom which we use to cut it down to precisely the successors. I mean this plus means successor. The successors of empty set. Yeah, successor of empty set is 1, 2, three like iterated successors. So, uh, actually now I am going to write down the description of natural numbers. Let us uh, do that. So, y I mean uh, y is a natural number. If I mean I am going to write down a big sentence if y is equal to empty set or there exists an x such that y is equal to x plus. Yes, this is true, this first part is true. Either a natural number is 0 or it is successor of something else. And moreover, uh, right, so this is the first part and for all x in y, either x is equal to empty set or there exists a z such that x is equal to z plus. So, every element of the natural number is itself either 0 or it is a successor of something. So, this particular formula, yeah, this is a logical formula. So, this particular formula describes what is a natural number. All of you agree with this? I mean, at least can you understand that this defines a natural number? Right. So, uh, let us say we are working with 
टू वट आर दी एलिमेंट्स ऑफ टू जीरो एंड वन सो जीरो एंड वन आर देमसेल्स नेचुरल नंबर सो द सेकेंड पार्ट से इज प्रिसाइजली दैट वी आर सेंग दिस इज अ नेचुरल नंबर इट इज आइदर जीरो और सक्सेसर ऑफ समथिंग एंड एवरी एलिमेंट इज ऑल्सो आइदर जीरो और सक्सेसर ऑफ समथिंग मीन्स इट इज ऑल्सो अ नेचुरल नंबर एंड दिस प्रोसेस इज कंटिन्यूड या यू कीप चेकिंग दिस फॉर द एलिमेंट्स ऑफ एलिमेंट्स ऑफ एलिमेंट्स विच प्रोसेस बाय द वे हैज टू स्टॉप because of this because of axiom of foundation now notice something notice this particular element yeah this omega in in our aaj nahi chahiye sirf friday ko chahiye friday 12 baje yeah this has become our running joke right <laughs> when they are supposed to come they don't come and when they are not supposed to be here they will be here okay so look at this particular element omega is omega empty no omega is not empty and is omega successor of something yes sir no omega is not itself a successor of anything omega is the collection of all natural numbers omega plus 1 is the successor of omega correct but omega itself is not a successor of anything i mean omega is like 0 1 2 3 dot 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 and after that dot 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 there is omega so is there any immediate predecessor of omega right it's a jump a leap of faith you may call it yeah it's a jump from all natural numbers to the collection of natural numbers so therefore omega if it is an element then it is not an uh, i mean omega as a set is not a natural number so this narrows down our collection like this formula indeed defines natural numbers yes because the concept of like this axiom of infinity doesn't really talk about the second part observe that it just says that whenever there is an element then its successor is also there it doesn't put any condition on which element should be there are you getting the difference between these two statements the first statement just says that either Uh, so empty set is always there so therefore it's and whenever there is an element then its successor is also there so therefore one will be there two will be there dot dot dots all the natural numbers will be there for sure moreover if there is some other element then its plus will also be there its plus will also be there you just close it under successors but you don't know about its history whereas being a natural number means that we are well founded at the empty set we also know how to trace its history back to the empty set any other questions yeah this is quite uh, philosophical so, so we have not defined the set of all y no this is the this is omega omega is the collection of all such y such that y is a natural number and its existence as a set is guaranteed by the axiom of infinity and axiom of specification which i don't want to talk about okay. yes uh, by omega is not a natural number because uh, does it satisfy this first square bracket like is omega empty is omega a successor of something yes sir like if omega is up to 0 1 2 up to n so no omega is not 0 1 2 up to n omega is 0 1 2 up to n and n plus 1 and dot 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 so it's dot 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 that that is the problematic thing it's not really it doesn't have a history it doesn't have a predecessor an immediate predecessor basically omega is tending to 
Omega is? Oh, that kind of statement doesn't make sense in this class. What is the meaning of omega tending to infinity? Has infinite omega has infinite elements, yes. So but uh, omega tending to infinity is not really a proper statement. Omega is a fixed set in zermelo frankel set theory whose existence is guaranteed by the axiom of infinity and some other axioms. But do you understand that omega doesn't have a predecessor, it's not plus of anything. Okay, so now we have established what is the collection of natural numbers for the first time. Yes, omega is a successor of what? Please tell me. Omega has a successor, yes. Yes, every set has a successor. Yes, because successor is simply defined to be you take x and then you take its union with singleton x. Now, this is certainly going to be larger than x. Yeah, uh, with this definition. So, x is, uh, so clearly for any x, x is a proper subset of x plus. Can you see this? Why? Yes. <coughs> By using the axiom of foundation. Because x itself is not an element of x, but it is an element of x plus. So, therefore, we, we have a proper con inclusion. Omega is defined to be the collection uh, to the set of all natural numbers. Yeah. So, omega plus one is also not the collection of natural numbers. Yeah, because omega is not a natural number. I, I don't know how that, that those two statements are related. See, omega is the collection of natural numbers. So there can only uh, uh, be one set which is the collection of natural numbers. So, we have defined that. So, obviously, it cannot be omega plus. It cannot be omega plus plus. Yes, any question? It probably do not know how to phrase a question right now. Sir, so this set 0, 1, 2, omega, omega plus 1, this is not a set of natural numbers. No, no, that is not a set of natural numbers, but the set of natural numbers is a subset of this as well as element of this. <laughs> Understood? This, uh, this first part is says that it is a subset and this particular thing says that it is also an element. Yes. Sir, I didn't understand how is it an element? Because omega is the collection of, is the set of natural numbers and omega is written in this list form. So, therefore, it is also an element. Sir, then what is omega? What is omega? Omega plus 1 is omega plus. It is the successor of omega. So, it contains 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot and then comma omega. Omega plus, see this, this definition is defined, I mean this is, uh, this particular plus construction is defined for any set. x plus is defined for any set, no matter whether you are starting with a natural number or not. Because of axiom of foundation, x is not an element of x and therefore, we can construct x plus. We are allowed to do unions. We, axiom of pairing guarantees that singleton x is a set. x is a set is given, singleton x is a set by axiom of pairing. And therefore, x union singleton x is a set and it is a proper superset of x. So, it is a new set. Understood this part again? Any other questions? So, how do we show the uniqueness of omega? Uniqueness of omega? You are saying that there is only one omega. There is only one omega. Okay, so that is called axiom of 
specification or replacement. So you actually cut down. So you start with any infinite set which is guaranteed by this axiom of infinity and then you intersect it with the collection that we have here. You add this property in its definition, then you will always get just the omega. Yeah, so that's axiom of specification. It allows you to chop down some part of, of a set. But yeah, we, we don't want to discuss like very formal axiomatic set theory. This is semi-axiomatic set theory that we are doing. We are writing down some axioms, we are not writing down others. Axiom of infinity doesn't give this particular expression. I'm just saying there exists a set which has this property. But zero exists and zero and then zero plus exists, that is one exists. Zero plus, yes, and x plus x. exists for every x. So if zero exists, uh, zero plus exists, then one plus exists and so on. Yes. It's just like, it's, we have already defined natural numbers. So this like no, 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 no. See, I, the, again, please look at this part. We are not only defining natural numbers, but this red underline just says that whenever you have an element, then its plus is also there. Okay, any other questions? We are spending half an hour just on this today. And I don't mind that because you have to understand these things. Omega union singleton omega. Yes, that's all. Right. Okay, let's proceed now. Now, the second part is we now know what to do with the set of natural numbers. It exists. Omega exists. Now, we want to define a function on omega. Function on omega. Yeah, with domain omega. So, uh, for example, uh, I mean, of course, we can say because it's a set, we know the collection of all functions from omega to any other set, right? So, uh, given a set X, we would like to define a function f from omega to x that can be described by a rule. Yeah, this I am going to leave undefined. That can be described by a rule. Can you guess what I am referring to? The definition, of function. the definition of function by? So I start somewhere, yeah, for defining a map from omega to x, I start somewhere and then I always describe the next value in terms of the previous values. What is it called? Recursion. Uh, are there any people who want to say induction? Is this called function definition by recursion or induction? Recursion. recursion. So, yes, so by a rule is an, it stands for recursion. Now, first of all, you should understand the difference between recursion and induction. So, recursion is used to define something for each natural number. definition for each natural number. We are not trying to prove anything. Whereas induction is a proof for each natural number. <coughs> yeah. 
So these two num uh, terms are different. Both of them have common features that there will be a base case. So uh, in induction, we have to prove the statement, a certain property for the base case. In definition, in, in recursion, we have to define it to be something specific for the base case. And then you have an inductive case or recursive case. Yeah, so uh, the successor case on both sides we have successor cases. So induction is a method of proof, recursion is a met is a way to define certain things. So by a rule means by recursion. Okay, so. Uh, any any questions about this recursion versus induction? These are just two different names, but many times, I mean, this is the first class I have seen where everybody agreed to recursion and not induction. Maybe some people did not know what to say. Okay, so uh, now I am going to specify this particular. I, I will use a new page for this. So suppose. x is a non-empty set x0 is an element of x and f capital f from x to x is a function okay so there is some endo function endo function means whose domain and codomain is the same there is a an endo function f on x. So uh, the principle of mathematical recursion I am not going to prove this but this is a state this is a theorem which we can prove I am not going to prove it right now and we will see in the future if it is uh, necessary. So. Uh, given the above data there exists a unique function small f from omega to x such that f of 0 is equal to x0 and f of n plus is equal uh, is equal to not by definition i will remove that is equal to capital f of f of n there can be more than one base case there can be more than one base case yes of course, I am writing it in the simplest possible form right now. Yeah, There is also a general version which does not even use the base case and yeah, the, we will perhaps do it in when we study ordinals because for ordinals we will need transfinite recursion and transfinite induction. So trans means beyond. So beyond finite we will uh, define something over all ordinals and uh, prove things for all ordinals. Okay, so this is the simplest possible case. Yeah, we are uh, doing ba only one base case, and then we are proceeding. So this actually defines a sequence. It's a recursive definition of a sequence, which is where our discussion started today. So f of zero is x zero. Then once you have x zero, then the next sequence is yeah. So this defines a sequence. So what is the sequence uh, x0 then f of x0 yes then f square of x0 and dot dot dot. Now this particular theorem the principle of mathematical recursion gives meaning to this dot dot dot. Yeah. 
Yes. So, do you understand that x0 is the value of little f of 0? That is there. Then capital F of x0 is the value of small f of z 1. Then small f of 2 is equal to f square of x0 and so on. But this so on or dot 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 has to be mathematically specified. And this, this theorem which is known as the principle of mathematical recursion, it actually gives meaning to this so on. Yeah, we can continue like this so that we obtain a function which is defined on, defined on entire of omega. It is defined for each natural number. If you want to do it uh, on the domain which is finite, let us say 0, 1, 2 up to 100, then you do not need principle of recursion. You just do it one by one. However, if you want to do it for all natural numbers at the same time, then you need to resort to this statement. You understand this? Yeah, the, I mean many times, the, I mean even if I write down its proof, the proof is not hard. But even if I write down the proof, then what really is the point is the main question. In mathematics, we can never leave anything undefined. We have to be very precise all the time. So that precision has to be also uh, has also to be about this dot 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 that's so on. Yeah, we have to formalize this process that once you have defined a rule to obtain the next thing from the base case, then this actually defines a function on the entire omega. Okay, so it's not uh, the the principle itself is not hard. The statement is not hard. The proof is not hard. But the philosophical question is hard. Yes. No, I already said that I am doing it for the simplest possible version. Yeah, there can be multiple base cases, and there is a more formal version of this. I don't want to do it. Fibonacci, yes, Fibonacci sequence with, works with two base cases and we can generalize this but this is the simplest version of principle of recursion. Right now just try to focus on what it wants to say yeah, rather than the most general case. Sir, yes? Even if you do, uh, even if you define f of n plus is equal to capital F to the power n, uh, n plus 1 perhaps, uh, n f to the power n plus of x naught, once again, how do you make sure that all the powers, I mean, the, uh, you can do it until a certain number, for any fixed number you can define that much power. Yeah, a capital F to the power 100, capital F to the power 1 million, you can do that. But the question is, does this rule allow you to define it for every natural number? Yes, so that is my point, that it feels that we are not really proving anything, but just like we had to guarantee the existence of an infinite set, we have to guarantee the existence of a function which is defined on omega, an infinite set. You can do it for any natural number, but can you do it for all natural numbers at the same time? That is the real question. You understand difference between any and all? Again, yeah, you are using the word induction. Induction is used for proofs. We are not proving anything here, we are just, we are proving the existence of a function which is recursively defined, not inductively defined. Yes, so we have to be careful about language. We are defining a function, so it has to be recursion and not induction. Okay, enough of philosophy, let us do some example. Yeah, so, uh, so choose. 
x equal to omega, then uh, x naught equal to a, yeah, a in omega, some particular a, it is our choice, and capital F from omega to omega is simply n mapping to n plus. Okay, what function little f is it trying to define? Okay, let me write it down. What is f of 0? A. And what is f of n plus? What is f of n plus? Use this definition, f of n plus is capital F of f of n. So this is f of n plus. So we are starting with a and every time we are adding 1. So what exactly are we defining? Therefore f of n is equal to a plus n, exactly. So that is how we define addition. Yeah, to do something so simple, we had <laughs> a very long way. We are not defining addition as a binary function. Yeah, we are not taking two different values as input and spitting out the output. We are defining it as a sequence of functions which have only one variable. A is fixed here. For each A, we define it like this. Then again we can use principle of mathematical recursion to define it as a function of functions yeah, where a is the parameter and then that will become a two variable function. Too much? I will repeat. Yeah? So we can again use this a as our starting uh, uh, as as our parameter of the function and choose a different x. x is the set of functions from omega to omega and a is the parameter and then we will define it as a two variable function. Plus, yeah, I mean, see ultimately plus is a function from omega cross omega to omega. Right now we are fixing this fixing this particular value and then defining a function. Then later on, once we have enough functions for each a in omega, then we can take the collection of all functions and define a sequence of functions to define this two variable plus. Right now we are just doing it for one. Okay. Sir, next, year, next, how do you know that capital F exists? Capital F exists, I mean this is a well-defined function. By axiom of infinity, this capital F from omega to omega is well defined. So do we have to use the principle of oh, principle of my ref okay, I understand your question. Principle of recursion, yes. Yes. By axiom of infinity, we can guarantee something like that. Yes. Yes. Okay. I am going to write down one more thing, yeah, the, then, uh, so this is our first one. So we are going to choose x equal to omega, uh, okay, so this is first one. So choose x equal to omega, then x naught equal to 0 and also choose a in omega, right, we are uh, going to use that in the definition and f from omega to omega now is defined to be n mapping to n mapping to what n plus a right then what will be f of n in this case yes so that will be a 
uh, you can verify this that it is actually the multiplication function a dot n. Yeah, because we are starting with 0. So f of 0 is 0. And then f of 1 is 0 plus a. f of 2 is 0 plus a plus a, which is 2a, and so on. This is how you teach addition and multiplication to a computer. OK? All those functions are already inbuilt. You think that they are inbuilt, but somebody has programmed these recursive definitions inside. OK, one last thing. Third one. Uh, well, I want to define exponentiation. Tell me how to start. x equal to omega, x naught equal to huh? 1. Very good. And f from omega to omega, it is defined to be n maps to n dot a, which we just defined. Yeah, so use that. Use addition to define multiplication. Use successor to define addition. Use multiplication to define exponentiation. Okay, then f of n will be will turn out to be a to the power n. Yeah, because a to the power 0 is indeed 1. And a to the power 1 is 1 dot a. a to the power 2 is a dot a and so on. Okay. So, uh, we have defined three basic operations on natural numbers. We cannot define subtraction. Correct? 2 minus 3 is not defined. Sir, actually, we defined a dot n dot n dot a. a dot n? No, uh, yes. But that won't matter. Yeah, yeah. We haven't shown that equal. We, yes. So, by induction, we can show that addition is commutative, addition is associative. Then multiplication is commutative, multiplication is associative, everything can be done. Okay, those are proofs by induction. If you want, we can uh, do some of them in the future. Yeah, but I want to do the more general version. These versions you already know. We should do it for ordinals and not just for finite ordinals, which are natural numbers. Okay. So, uh, I had given you some homework. What is an equivalence relation? Can you just tell me? What's an equivalence relation on a set? It is a, it is a binary relation. It is a subset of A cross A, which, which is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Okay, so these three properties are satisfied. And given any partition of a set. What is the partition? It is a collection of non-empty subsets such that every element of the set belongs to exactly one subset of that collection. Okay, so that's a partition. So partitions and equivalence relations are the same. Yeah, that's also one of the exercises on the tutorial sheet. There is one more part of this and using equivalence relations on pairs of natural numbers tomorrow we'll begin by defining the set of integers now we have at our hand addition multiplication and this oh let me finish by just saying one line yeah so the notation n refers to either omega with blank plus as the operation. This is an algebraic operation. So blank plus is a function from omega to omega or omega then plus from omega cross omega to omega then dot from omega to omega, omega cross omega to omega and yeah, I mean, usually just these and maybe sometimes exponentiation. So some algebraic operations 
defined on the set of natural numbers, then we refer to it as n. Whereas omega is stands for the set of natural numbers with less than relation or the relation less than relation is also same as the belongs to relation. So they, these are two different purposes. Yeah, the n refers to more algebraic setting, whereas omega refers to the order relation. Okay. So look here. Yeah, the this is your first glimpse of the axiom of choice. Yeah. So in the class we have seen that product of two countable sets is countable. Yes. So therefore by induction if you may yeah product of finitely many countable sets is countable well uh, what are the elements of finite cartesian products they are ordered tuples yeah ordered pairs we have seen kuratowski's definition ordered tuples you can do similar way yeah singleton x1 single then doubleton x1 x2 then tripleton x1 x2 x3 and so on yeah, or maybe you have to use some other definition, but you, you can do that. However, now the question is how to define infinite Cartesian product. Okay, so infinite Cartesian product is not something easy to do, set theoretically. So for that, we need to start with an infinite family of non-empty sets. So why non-empty? Because if at all one of the sets turns out to be empty, then yeah, it's like multiplication by zero. Yeah, everything will simply vanish. So we don't want that to happen. So we'll start with an infinite family of non-empty sets. So that means capital I is an infinite set, right? A choice function on this family is defined to be a function from capital I to the union of Xi's. Union of any family is always defined. Yeah, I mean, if I call this family Y, then this is simply union of Y. Family and set are not different. It just, uh, for our convenience, I am calling this a family. Okay. So, uh, so a choice function on this family uh, is such a function such that it satisfies one peculiar property that CI is in xi. Well, you want to select, you want to choose infinitely many elements, but you, you always want to choose them appropriately. For ith index, you should choose it from xi. For i prime, you should choose it from xi prime. So definition is clear. This is a choice function. Now what is the Cartesian product? The Cartesian product is collection of all choice functions. Yeah, this looks very weird. I mean, normally, how would you write a Cartesian product? You will like infinite tuple, right? Uh, when you write a sequence, then you would say that it's infinite tuple. But that tuple has this property, right? That A1 belongs to capital A1, B1 belongs to capital B, um, sorry, A2 belongs to capital A2 and so on. So again, to give meaning to so on, we have to do it properly using choice functions. So that's the only requirement for understanding this. Now the next question is, uh, is this countable? What do you think? Is infinite product of countable sets countable? Well, the real answer is before knowing anything about it, yeah, does this choice function exist? Right? So that, that depends, I mean in general, yeah, I mean if I am not talking about natural numbers, I don't know anything about the sets xi. So in that case, I have no idea whether such a choice function exists or not. Axiom of choice is the statement which ensures existence of at least one choice function. 
However, let us not go there, that will come later, but we want to understand whether product of natural numbers, infinite product of natural numbers indexed by natural numbers, is that countable? What is your feeling? No? Yeah, we are assuming axiom of choice, so he is saying no, you are saying yes. Yes, do you have any proof? Uh, yesterday in the class I covered that assuming countable axiom of choice, countable union of countably infinite sets is countably infinite. Countable union. I never said anything about products because products are defined today. Like informally, like uh, suppose you do have a bijection, uh -huh. you can like go along the diagonal end. Correct. Okay. So he is referring to Cantor's diagonal argument again. Let us do it properly for another function, uh, uh, another set. Yeah, so this is, is this set of functions from natural numbers to natural numbers countable? Yeah, so this is a famous Cantor's diagonal argument. Okay, so uh, Cantor's arguments usually involve contradictions. So let us start with the assumption that suppose this is countable. Okay, suppose this is countable. Then what can we say about this? Then there exists a bijection yeah bijection between this set and natural numbers so which means i can say that this is the zeroth entry this is the first entry and so on yeah then all such functions can be listed uh, say f0 f1, f2 and dot dot dot. Yeah, this is the complete list of elements of all such functions. Now the trick, yeah, the Cantor's diagonal argument is a trick. It says that suppose this is a complete list, then I will construct a new function which is not in the list. How do we ensure that? A function which is not in this list. Uh -huh. H of zero would be f of z, f zero of define zero. h, okay, define h from n to n. Yeah. Mm -hmm. H of zero would be f zero of zero plus one and so on. Like, okay, so uh, I'm going to say it is f n of n plus. Yeah, f n of n plus. Define this, and now I'm going to claim. Yeah, this is the Cantor's diagonal argument that you are defining something which is different from everything. Yeah, so claim uh, that H is not in the list. So we have already listed all the elements. So H is not in the list. Why? It is different from yeah. the KH function. Exactly. So clearly, h is not equal to fn for h of n is not equal to fn of n for any n. And that is the argument. Yeah? So, if we said that we have listed all the functions from natural numbers to natural numbers, then we found one more function which was not listed, well you could say that let us add this function to the list, yeah why not, yeah before f0 let us make more space, let us call it f minus 1, but then again there will exist another function by the same argument and this process will never end. So this shows 
that f uh, functions from n to n is uncountable. Now, why diagonal? Let me quickly write that. So, look at this f0 of 0, then f0 of 1, and dot dot dot, then f1 of 0, f1 of 1, and dot dot dot, f2 of 0, and so we are taking the diagonal and we are disturbing the diagonal. Yeah, by saying plus 1, we are disturbing the diagonal. So, that is why this is called Cantor's diagonal argument. We are playing with the diagonal. Can we write it more formally like you said that we can add this. So, how to write it more formally and we have to dot 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 more abstractly like. Oh, I mean, uh, see, this, then list all such functions is saying same thing as there exists a bijection from natural numbers to functions from n to n. It's a particular bijection. Yeah, and if it, it is a bijection, then we have listed all the elements. Yeah, I mean functions of, it is surjective. So all functions have been considered. So where is this function coming from? Right, so understood this idea? Now, can you use the same idea to prove the previous one? Is the product of natural numbers Identify which union with which function. In the Cartesian, uh, the choice function is a yeah. function from the naturals to the naturals, right? Choice function is a function from naturals to naturals, yes. So, I, so this is essentially the same as asking if the set of all choice functions uh -huh. uh, is countable or not. However, in this case, the choice functions are all functions also. See, in this case, yeah. Uh, here, union of n, where n belongs to n, is equal to n, and i is also equal to n. And therefore, yeah, therefore, what will happen? A choice function is any function. And therefore, this product of n indexed by natural numbers is same as fun n n. And we already solved the problem for this. Understood? Simple argument. Let's stop.